In today's episode, we're talking with an expert in storytelling about infusing speech, story, and even humor into your business messaging, sales presentations, and product pitches. You do not want to miss this one, so don't you change that dial or drop that phone. We're about to level it up and shatter the mold. Question. In a world where groupthink is the norm, others want what you've earned, and thinking for yourself will get a target painted on your back, how do you flip the script and level up your business, your money, relationships, your health, your status, and your life? That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. My name is Andrew S. Kaplan, and it's time to shatter the mold. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Shatter the Mold. Andrew S. Kaplan, really excited to be here with you today. We've got an awesome and really interesting guest. Can't wait to get there. But before we do, quick update on the last Law of Attraction book you'll ever need to read. Things continue to go well, and I have you to thank for it. So thank you to everyone who's bought the book, all the five-star rave reviews, and of course, all the people emailing me to let me know how you're liking and more importantly, using the content in that book. Quick hello, of course, to people that found me through the Yahoo article last year or the USA Today article or Forbes article earlier this year. And of course, thanks to anyone who found me in any other way, including ones that got recommendations from friends. I always love those. And if you've not checked out the book yet, you can feel free to go to lastlawofattractionbook.com. That'll auto forward to the Amazon listing where you can get it in Kindle or paperback or audiobook if you prefer, and if you do not want to pull out your wallet but you want to check out what this content is really all about, youtube.com slash andrewcap is the link you want to go to where I have free content devoted to the book, including new techniques that people have been really enjoying and really giving me good feedback on, along with some featured LOA experts and, of course, a few other surprises. With that said, let's dive straight into our interview. I'm going to switch up mics, and we'll have our conversation with Sarah. All right. We, we've got a really, really fun guest today. And I'll just say this. If you're looking to add an authentic and engaging tone to any speaking that you might do for your podcast or webinar or keynote, and you understand that there are ways that you can boost the power of these presentations through storytelling and language techniques that will have your audience on the edge of their seats, and you're wondering if you can do all this while still finding a way to deliver your pitch in a humorous, warm performance that will make them fall in love with both you and your message then someone you might just want to turn to for help with all this is my guest of the day, Sarah Archer. Sarah's done sets at the Comedy Store in London, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, and numerous other venues across the UK. She's also authored two business books, bolstered by her corporate experience and her heavy background in NLP and coaching. And we haven't even yet touched on her highly successful podcast, The Speaking Club, which is currently streamed across over 170 countries and counting. In other words, if you need to make your pitch powerfully authentic and effective as you leverage your speaking into your most powerful marketing tool, and you want to take your career, brand, or business to the next level, Sarah is probably someone you might want to turn to for this. And I'm sure she's got a lot of awesome insights to share with us today. So without any further ado, Sarah Archer, thank you so much for being here and welcome to Shatter the Mold. Blimey, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. God, my ego is like, I'm not going to be able to fit outside the door now. That's really <laughs> <laughs> That is often the goal of these. We just prop that guest up, make them super excited. <laughs> and then they're like, wait, what's going on here? Oh my God, a beautiful interview just happened here. Cool. But no, you know what? It's funny. Yeah, I, I, I said all these great things, but all of them are true. So there must be something to the magic that we have here. And, you know, that's that's not even being funny, no pun intended, because I know that part of what you do is comedy, but it seems like you've got this really thorough, um, just across the board understanding and expertise where you're, you're taking from your corporate experience and you're taking from comedy and humor and storytelling and you're combining all these experiences and all these pieces of the puzzle into something that I guess where you're working with clients, you take their presentations wherever they wanna to go to the next level. Is that like a fair way of, of kind of describing what you do in your work? Yeah, it is. I mean, when I was younger, my father used to say that I was a jack of all trades, master of none. Now it's called a portfolio career, which sounds way cooler. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's essentially, I, I mean, I, I'm really curious. I love learning. And so um, obviously I've got experience that in my own experience, but I take things from everywhere and I have this ability. I, I don't know, it's what they call it. I guess my superpower is sort of seeing, bringing these things together. And yeah, I, I love doing what I do and I love helping people get their message across more powerfully mm. and in a way that just engages that's you know but I do pull from all sorts of different areas to do it I love it and I mean the thing I mean obviously you know you're doing comedy sets at, at these impressive venues is this a passion of yours that um kind of 
like it was always been there or did that kind of come later after like the corporate piece of what you were doing? So, well, it's interesting. So I don't do comedy so much. I don't do stand up so much these days, but what I do do is I incorporate the comedy into plays. So I write plays now more mm. than actual stand up. But so I, I've always loved to perform, I guess. And I wanted to be an actress when I was younger and I went to audition for drama school and I didn't get in because partly I guess I, I did a bit of self-sabotage because when I walked in I saw all these beautiful model looking girls and I'm like I don't look like that and so I was like intimidated and didn't I guess didn't perform at my best and they said go and get some life experience and come back so I went out and got some life experience and then got stuck on that treadmill of you know money and and everything else and sort of lost my way for quite a long time and I think when I, I, my daughter was just one, I think, or coming up for one. So this was like, she's 20 now. So this is a long time ago. Um, my then sort of husband and I went out for a, a, a rare night out to a comedy club. And the compare said, you know, anyone that wants to tell a joke in the, you know, when we come back from the interval, let me know. And I'm like, I could do that. And I sort of like, I went for it. And I told a joke, I hadn't written it myself, but I told a joke and they said, you should do something with it. So I went and did a comedy course and, and, you know, took it from there and ended up having solo shows at Edinburgh. And, you know, I would say I, I did well, but I never made it big. You know, I didn't never, you know, never seen me on a Netflix special or anything like that. And part of it is, it's cause it's bloody hard. You know, you have to be out till, you know, the early hours of the morning. And, and I had a, a child and it, it was, di it was difficult, but, you know, I kept plugging away, but now I love what I do because I can, you know, I actually, I still perform, but um, I do a bit of comedy, but mostly act these days and write plays and so produce and direct plays alongside what I do in business. Mm -hmm. So I was a late bloomer, um, but it, I've always loved to perform. I love it. Now you take a, a unique person or bring a unique, unique perspective rather to all this. And I've heard you say before that storytelling and humor are the secret weapons of sales success. And I just want to ask you to expand on a little bit what you mean by that and, and how that really comes into play. Well, yeah, I mean, partly something you said, because I had the I was blessed to be able to interview you um, this week. And, and I know you said something about this. So part of it is that we have been conditioned for, you know, millennia to lean in when it comes to stories, because before we could write um, storytelling was the only way that we could pass on information that was really important. So it had to, you know, they put it in a story format so that people could, you know, get the importance of, of passing it on and it was easier to pass on. And the storytellers were always the ones that rose, you know, into powerful positions because they could, you know, you know, they could lead people and all sorts of things. But so there's that aspect of it. And, you know, we, you know, when our mums read our stories at bedtime, you know, it's, it's, it's in our sort of veins, if you like, but not only that, and th there's, there's all sorts of science around this, but, and you'll know when you're listening to this from your own experience, from going to see a movie or reading a book, when you go and see a movie, you are vicariously living that experience through the hero of that movie. And I know myself, when I go and see a movie where there's action and cars, I come out, get in my car and I think I'm, you know, I can, I can do all sorts of, you know, tricks. I'm, you know, it affects me. And, and we're emotionally affected by stories. We are with the person telling the story and we, we identify with the hero. So if we're using stories in our business to get our message across, we have the opportunity to get people emotionally bought in to what we're talking about, whether it's our product idea or service or whatever it is, you know, our message. Um, and we have to do that first before we can sell them on it logically. So mm -hmm. stories are the vehicle for getting emotional buy-in to whatever it is that you're, you're telling people about. So that's why they're so powerful. They create that bridge to, to getting people to, to get on the same page as you. Because what normally happens is that we go out and find something that we fall in love with and we, you know, we get that emotional buy-in and then we go and sell ourselves on it logically. 
And then that's when we go and tell people about it and we use, you know, techno babble and whatever. And, and not only do people find fault with it, you know, they, they don't get it. They find fault with it. And no matter how many wonderful features and benefits you tell them about, they just don't get it. So that's why stories are the secret weapon for me. Mm. There is another aspect to it as well, which is about grabbing attention because we have to get past the sort of croc, what I call the croc, bro. it's not just me. There's a great book called Pitch Anything by Oren Claff. And he talks about this, which is, you know, before we can get to the, the most, the, the sort of logical reasoning part of someone's brain, we have to get past the bouncer. Everything goes through this sort of um, reptilian brain. So you've got to grab its attention using things like curiosity and fear and desire before you can get them to engage at a higher level. So multiple reasons why we've got to use stories in our business. Mm. Um, and I love, I love them. I think they're amazing. Yeah, now I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that it's also like a beautiful cheat code because besides being effective, relatively speaking, it's rare. A, a lot of people, you know, they just don't know to bring this aspect in, meaning they end up sounding like everybody else. <laughs> Whereas the people that are actually telling the stories, those are the ones that really stick out like a sore thumb for better or worse and become more memorable. And the extra piece that I'm getting from you that, that we haven't discussed yet is there's also, even though you spoke about, you know, pitch anything and, and that pattern interrupt for it to, you know, put some words in your mouth, but you also talk about humor. Where mm. does humor come into play? How much value does that have in the entire equation if people are going about it in this way? So I think, I mean, I'm always, I'm very, I'm, always using a spider-man quote in relation to humor so uh spider-man's uncle talks you know when you've got great power you have to use it responsibly mm -hmm. and with humor especially in business we have to use it carefully is you know responsibly so humor i think is a wonderful tool for getting people to to like you and to also help with that you know making your message more memorable um it can break the ice um, it can, you know, the, the likability is a big part of this uh, as well. And so, yeah, I mean, humor, it, it just, if, if I was, I always say storytelling is powerful. And if you can sprinkle in some humor, it makes it magical. Um, mm. And that combination of the two is, is an amazing, uh, amazing way to get people to buy into your stuff. Yeah. Now I'm going to make an assumption here. So please correct me if I'm, if I'm going off here. <clears throat> and you even use the word sprinkle. It sounds to me like part of what you do when you're helping people is you'll show them how to inject humor, but you'll also make sure that it's measured, that they spread it out so that it's it's well-timed and well-placed humor so that they are still taken seriously. It's almost like a movie trailer where you want to see that movie, but there's always like, even when it's a serious movie, they'll sneak in like the, the one-line zinger by, you know, by Bruce Willis as John McClane or something. It's still like Die Hard. Like that's the feeling that I'm getting that you might bring to this mix in terms of the humor in the equation. Is that correct? Or a fair yeah, way to put absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and also, you, you know, when we think about movies and stuff like that, screenwriters will use humor almost like to sandwich the, the hard stuff. So let's say, you know, someone's telling their origin story and they're, you know, and, and, they're, and some people's origin stories, there's some, some hard parts. So you've got to give your audience a break in mm. in a story you know and so humor is a bit of light relief so there's all sorts of different ways you can use it but it's a bit of light relief um also it's great you know i always talk about people using metaphors and analogies to to get things across in a way that's concrete and relatable for people in their stories but if you can you can exaggerate the metaphor and add in a bit of humor it makes it even more powerful as a, as a sort of a memoir for people to be able to to uh, sort of latch onto it. But yeah, using it in the right place, you know, giving a talk, doing a pitch, it's not a stand up comedy gig. So mm. we don't want joke, joke, joke. We want it in the right place um, and appropriately, appropriately used. Um, and, you know, so one of the aspects of the things that I work with people on is when you've got the, the script of your talk, and we always start with a script, even though I want people to let go of it and trust and, and be as natural as possible. When we look at the script, we look at the big moments of their talk and where, you know, humor would be appropriate, where we need to use the voice to bring people in or push them away or, you know, where we need to use some physical gestures or whatever. So it's, it's, it's almost using humor along with voice and body language and expression to choreograph a talk or a pitch 
to to take the audience on that journey and that's mm. you know that's it's part of a bigger thing but absolutely used you know appropriately and carefully yeah and i'm guessing that people come to work with you and you know they've heard good things and they know that you know your stuff but their first thing is like sarah i'm not a funny person and i'm assuming to which you're like that's okay we're going to craft three spots so you don't have to be again you don't have to give a, a one hour set at the comedy club we're gonna give you like these choice things that you're gonna insert and that's gonna take after everything is that the way you kind of like play it with them yeah, I mean, I taught comedy courses, so I used to get quite a few business people actually come to me to to learn stand up comedy, and mm. they would come, you know, to learn it from me, and and they would say, I'm, you know, I don't think I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I'm funny, but this, whether it's storytelling, whether it's humor, it is all about systems and processes and formulas. You know, yes. there is a formula for comedy, for for making something funny. There are, you know, I have systems and tools that I teach to put a talk together, to put a story together. And the same is true with comedy. So there are tools and techniques you don't, I believe I can teach anyone to make people laugh. I believe I can teach anyone to become a great storyteller and a great speaker. Um, you know, so you know you don't have to be funny and in fact the people who think they're funny <laughs> they're not <laughs> uh, they're the ones who uh and the, you know they're the ones who who i think you know are most uh, at risk of of you know that sort of tumbleweed um yeah, yeah. so you know i think the more open you are to learning and using systems um the better and you know yeah. i actually love working with left brain people with technical people because i say this is the process follow the process they follow the process and they get results you know yeah. so I, I i love seeing that the new possibilities open up for people sometimes it's almost that awkward delivery because of their personality where like it makes it even funnier and they don't understand that that's part of it and um you know i i remember this book and i, I feel bad I, I hate talking about a book when i can't quote the title and point people towards there I, it was like a yellow cover and it was like, you know, comedy writing secrets or the secret writing comedy. It was something like that. And it was this really thick book. And, and the one thing I remember <laughs> from it was part of the, an aspect of comedy is surprise. It's like, you're laughing because you weren't expecting that thing, which hearing you speak reminds me and reinforces to me that this is about those pattern interrupts, this whole thing with as much or as little humor as you put in and the storytelling, this is about capturing and then holding in, you know, in the various oscillation, the attention of those people that you're speaking to, so that you have that opportunity to get your message across and give them the opportunity to be sold on whatever it is you're offering them. Yeah, absolutely. So the book is by a guy called Melvin Hellitzer. And yes. um, it's a great book. And, you know, I've obviously got my own book on, on comedy for speaking, but his is a wonderful book. And he talks about the, the formula. He's the one that sort of created this formula. It's called the threes formula. Mm. I won't go through it now, um, but I will just explain more about and build on what you said, Andrew. So effectively, comedians are like magicians because they are using misdirection to create surprise. And that's what makes one of the reasons why people laugh. So one of the great comedy tools is something called the rule of three. Um, the, you know, three is a magical number anyway, but in comedy, it's so important because it takes two things to make a pattern and the third thing breaks it. So mm. when you are, you know, you're saying you, you sort of have a setup to a joke and you sort of say this, you know, this thing, this thing, and the third thing fits, but it's completely, it, it, you know, it's funny or it's exaggerated or something like that. It breaks the pattern, but you are effectively just being like a ma magician and misdirecting the audience. So um, that's, you're exactly right. Surprise is one of the key elements, if not the most important element of comedy. I love that. You know, it's funny hearing you say that. I remember there was this thing, um, I think on America's Got Talent, where this guy had like um, a talking stuffed bird. And I remember hearing about that three and he did this. I don't want to spoil the joke for people, but he did something in a sequence of numbers where it got funnier and funnier and it really built up. And that last one you didn't see coming like that surprise. So hearing you say that reminds me of that. Now, <laughs> when people obviously, you know, they, they try to go out on their own and do this and they don't have someone like you guiding them. You know, there some are going to do better than others, but I, as I understand, it, there's probably a bunch of mistakes that people are making when they're trying to use speaking as their marketing tool and as their marketing vehicle. I figured, let me ask you, like, to speak to that. Like, what are some of the biggest mistakes people make when they're trying to sell through their speaking? So, I mean, you'll be familiar with these as a copywriter because I 
consider myself to be a speaking coach. Um, I also have a marketing aspect to my business and I consider it to be sparketing. So speaking as a marketing tool. So like we that. blend um, the two things together. So the first thing is sitting down to write your message using your neocortex, you know, so you're writing at that higher level and you're missing out on that you need to hook your audience in. So you'll be familiar with hooks. So mm -hmm. uh, the first thing you've got to do, you know, your talk title in itself is a hook. So building in the, the sort of curiosity and you've only got to think like when you go, um, you know, to a sort of shop at a shop and you're queuing and then there's those new newspapers or those magazines that have those really, you know, those titles that grab your attention. So you, you need to be doing that um, right out of the gate with your with your talk title. And when you start your talk, um, I talk about lightning bolts. So lightning bolts are there to shock the audience. So um, you know, you've got to grab their attention, stop them from looking at their phone, get them leaning in. And, you know, you can start with a question or you can start with silence or you can start with a prop. You've got to get them, like you said, the pattern interrupt to, to go, what, wait, what, what's that? What's she doing? Um, and so that's that's the big thing, you know, don't be like everyone else and particularly in pitching if I hear another I help so and so you know that whole I help thing right right. you know I cool. heard an episode you did actually on pitching where you took it to the a couple of levels on which is brilliant you don't want to be like everyone else and no one cares about you up front you've got to make them care first so right. so I always tell people to put the stuff about you at the back um, and, and think of a way to grab attention up front with your pitch. That's, you know, that's a, another thing. And then I guess another thing to say on a big mistake um, is around not giving people information. You know, I see a lot of speakers just give people information and information is cheap these days. What you need to be doing when you're speaking is giving them insight and opinion and being provocative. Because, you know, so those are sort of a couple of things. Make sure that you you get people's attention with the hook, um, that you you are, you know, using stories, obviously, and that you are giving them something of value, not just regurgitating stuff that they can mm. look up on the Internet. So these big mistakes are basically in neglecting this, in neglecting to begin with a hook, in neglecting yeah. the pattern interrupts, in neglecting yeah. to make it about them. The, yeah. the big mistake is in neglecting to make yourself stand out and have a recognition of what people often say. And yeah. um, I, I couldn't agree more. And I'm curious, like, you know, when you work with people, what often comes up as the biggest challenge or the biggest sticking point that a lot of them have as they're elevating their game and elevating their level of their presentation? Well, I think actually, again, this is something that you mentioned right at the end of our talk. And it's something that I, always always I call it a mindset hack and it for speakers um one of the biggest things is that we self-sabotage mm -hmm. so we you know we make it about us we 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 sort of all you know people worrying about people judging them people worrying about you know putting themselves ahead of their message so making yourself the vehicle for your message is I think one of the you know, shifting that perspective to see you, you literally are just the vehicle. It's important to show your personality, but it's, it's as a, as a way for you to get the message across rather than making it about you. Mm. Um, so that's, that's one of the key things I think uh, to all of this. And then, you know, I, I say there are three big fundamental things that undermine speakers. Or I, I say it causes awkward speakers and that's, you know, imposter syndrome, insecurity and inauth inauthenticity and there's a whole sorts of raft of things that come with that so hugging your script you know not playing you know not committing to it all sorts of things and what we want to shift towards is it becoming an awesome speaker spelt a u and the three things we need to be building is authority um, and that comes from confidence in the content that we're sharing audacity so being prepared to be provocative, to step into that sort of influencer leader, leader space um, and, uh, and authenticity, obviously. And so for me, it's, it's not 
are worrying about filler words and stuff like that yes you can always work on your skills your storytelling your humor performance whatever um but the most important thing is that it comes from the heart that you're passionate about your message and you know you care about the audience and where you want to take them so you know thinking about strategy in relation to all of that as well I know there's a lot there but kind of you know those are the things that make the difference you playing full out and being passionate and and not caring about you yeah no I you know what there there's a lot there but that's a good thing and I can personally assure people that these are tools that you stack on top of one another you get better and better as you master certain pieces of one other pieces are complemented by that and those get easier. It's, it's one of those things where it's almost like an upward snowball. And, you know, I'm really um, looking forward to getting your take on this, but from where I sit, a huge piece of all this is being willing to not be so good right away, but still do it to actually go through the process of telling your story. Even if you don't publish recording that webinar, writing that presentation, doing like actually putting yourself out there and putting yourself through the actual physical activity of speaking the words, hearing the cadence of your voice. Is that kind of where you line up as well on that? Absolutely. You know, I say, you know, a lot of people say, well, I'm not ready to do it. I'm not ready to speak. Well, the first thing is, when will you be ready? But, Mm -hmm. you know, when I work with people, they're not ready to speak to 250 people, but they're ready to start on the journey. And it is a journey. And you just have to, to shift perspective again on this and just think, every time I talk, I'm getting better. Every time I talk, I'm getting feedback about my performance. Like when I when I did stand up, I would always record myself, you know, I would because I want to see how that joke landed, how did the audience respond? Did I do something extra? You know, so it it is a journey and you're not going to be great right out of the gate, but where's the fun in that, you know? Mm. And, and also, you know, people, I wonder sometimes if people think, you know, it's a big investment. I say, you've got to be prepared and you, you need to put the effort into creating a talk, but I show people how to flex the same talk to, you know, and use it in different ways so that you're making that investment, get getting a big return on it. But the thing is this, there are so many bad speakers out there. And if you can speak well, if you can hold the audience in the palm of your hand, you will stand out and you, it, it will, you know, Warren Buffett says, if, if you can hone your communication skills, you can increase your worth by 50%. And, and not only that, the other thing, you know, financial is, is great. But the other thing I see when I work with people is it increases your self-worth. Because mm. if you know you can, you know, hold an audience's attention and take them on a journey, you, you, your self-confidence is amazing. And, you know, the people that I talk to do stand-up comedy, when they did their five minutes in front of 100 people, they were on, cl- you know, and they got claps and laughs. You know, it was a six-week course and we worked on their set, of course, and, you know, they put prepared and everything else, but they were on top of the world. There's no feeling more like, you know, more special than making someone laugh and it's your own stuff um so yeah so I think you know it's I I can't remember what you asked but yeah it's 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 an amazing thing and I and I love to see people surprise themselves with this stuff you made a very insightful point in in that in that answer because when people do this as they're getting better it bleeds over into everything else (laughs) they can repurpose their stories in different ways but more importantly one-on-one conversations they will command attention better they will stand up straighter. The cadence of their voice will carry confidence. And this will happen on autopilot. They won't even realize it's happening. Um, by the same token, though, it'll be easier to make phone calls. I mean, I personally recommend that if you're a salesperson and you want to get better, to reach out and, and connect with someone like you, Sarah, because going through that will make them better salespeople, even if everything's over the phone. Even if everything's on an email, I think because all the connect- connections in your brain, that communication carries over in different ways. So I, I really appreciate that you made that insight. Now, You also said, you know, you're not going to be perfect right away. Things take time. We have to do building blocks. With that said, I'm sure that a lot of the people that work with you are very ambitious. So in addition to being willing to do the work, they also want to get as many um, accelerators in there as possible. Are there any tools or steps or suggestions or insights that you give somebody that needs an, uh, like an early boost in their progress? Is there, is there a way to get them out of their shell or get them making faster progress? with whatever that you might be like sharing with them. Yeah, I mean, I think, it, I guess it's back to structure again. So I'm just in the middle of winding up. Uh, I do a five day, what I call a five day snackable story challenge. 
And the transformation I see over the course of this challenge is phenomenal. It's, it's completely free. And, you know, it's a way I bring people into my world along with the podcast. But having a structure that you can talk around is one of the fastest ways to accelerate your progress. And, and just, you know, I, you know, over the course of this challenge, they get training videos and every day I do some live coaching with them. And obviously through that live coaching, they're, they're getting practice and, you know, and uh, learning stuff as well as getting the experiential, you know, stuff um, with it. But having a structure can really help you because it feels like a bit of a Dumbo's feather in a sense, you know, someone says this structure works, you just, you know, use it. Um, and that gets people started really well. Mm. So, I, th- you know, I, I have a structure called the PAT structure and you learn all about it in the challenge. So for a snackable story, which is like three to five minutes, you can use them in your talks to sort of deal with uh, proactively deal with objections that might come up once you've told your sort of big idea story. Because even though we can get people to buy into our stuff with a story, following that they normally have some objections surface so these snackable stories are ones that you can use to sort of deal with those and also do facebook lives and all sorts of things and Mm. so it's really simple structure it's you set out the problem then you share your anecdote and the the anecdotes are always stories from their life and then a takeaway and having that structure just gives people a bit more confidence to to have a go, I think. So, you know, whether you can use my structures or find, you know, there's a, so many speaking books out there and they'll have a structure. Just go out and, and have a go and see what happens. Now, you mentioned you have two books. Do both of them cover this? Or like, what do those two books cover in regards to what you're teaching people? So Cracking Speech Mate is all about, I mean, it shows you, it absolutely takes you through the process of putting a talk together. But on top of that, it shows you how to use humor in those talks. So it focuses on that. Stand as, as, as straight to the top is all about pitching. So I give people structures for creating a pitch mm. um, and so on. So yeah, so um, the Pat one is is a new one I've introduced, but those two books, if you, you absolutely get a, tr- a structure for a talk and a pitch in in straight to the top. So, but I probably have another book in me at some point. Um, I would not be surprised. It sounds like we've covered a lot already. <laughs> Speaking of which, um, obviously, I've kind of tried to take us down a road where we're cherry picking as much gold as possible to give people, you know, an insight onto what's really involved here based on where we are in our conversation, is there anything that you think I might have missed in in asking you that might be important for the audience to hear? I think this is, this is a really important point. So when I work with um, my students, and you know, this counts as well, if you're an author of a book, if, if you're a speaker, if you're doing a webinar, if you're doing a podcast, whatever, really important thing, and something people miss often is putting yourself in your audience's shoes. So when you're, you know, we often approach things, especially when when it's our subject with an expert mindset, and we forget people are starting at a different level. But not only that, when you say something, what is your audience, you know, step into your shoes of your audience and say, what would they want to know about that? Have I covered everything? And what are they going to be curious about? If I say this, what else would they want to know? So, um, you know, even I, you know, I work with speakers, but I also, you know, some of my speakers are writing books and they'll bring their, you know, the, the book stuff to me as well. And, and we sort of go through the stories in their book. And I say, well, you know, if you say that, then they're going to want to know this. So really consider from your audience's perspective, you know, what are they going to, what questions are they going to come up with that you need to answer in mm. order for them to not get distracted, you know, because this is the thing, you know, if some, if you don't answer that question, or if you, you know, whether you're on stage or in a book or whatever, they're going to be thinking about that rather than listening to you. Right. So you've got to keep, you know, keep that in mind. So you've got to bring them with you on the journey. And you don't unless, want to lose of course, them. Unless, of course, it's the unanswered question that you want picking away at their mind. And therefore that becomes a strategy. But I imagine you've really got to know what you're doing with that because otherwise you're going to be falling into a trap. Well, no, I mean, I always talk about, you know, when we, when I talked about curiosity as a trigger, I'm always teaching speakers as well, especially when they're marketing to create gaps. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this, you know, if you know, your audience is probably familiar with problem solution problem. So, you know, you give people a problem, give them a solution. We need to be doing that in our talks, in our pitches, 
so that we, you know, absolutely right. You've got to create questions, but you're in control of the questions that you're creating the gap for, you know, and that's where your program or your, you know, your freebie or whatever it is, or the blog, wherever you're sending people, you know, but you've got to be in control of the question and intentional with it, not just miss something mm. out and then lose your audience. So right. yeah, but I think it's, it's the control of the question that makes the control of their attention. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Love it. Love it. Awesome. So I mean, we, we spoke about a couple of things, you know, you've got books and um, I mean, you've got a lot on a lot going on, which is awesome. If someone wanted to learn more about you and connect with you, what would be the best way for them to do that? Well, definitely go and check out the Speaking Club podcast. Um, it's, you know, there's 166 episodes there. And besides me giving you stuff, there's also great um, people sharing their information and views and stuff. So that's a, a good place to go. Um, you can pick up uh, straight to the top, uh, my pitching book for free at standoutpitch.com. Nice. And if you're up for having a go at the Snackable Story Challenge, the next one, well, they're, they're, they're coming up regularly, depends when this goes out, the next one is in early May, but um, go out, go to storyledmarketing.com and you'll find everything there. Awesome. And what I'll do is I'll take these links and I'll probably one or two more, I'll put them in the YouTube description of this if people are watching this on video. Or if people are listening on audio, I'll put it at shatteredamoldpodcast.com where this episode resides. So people will be able to find that pretty easily. Um, last question for you. I often ask my guests, if you can go back in time, <laughs> 10 years, 20 years, 25 years, whatever you want, and give any piece of advice to a younger version of yourself, it could be life advice, it could be business advice, it could be comedy advice, it could be storytelling advice, anything at all, what piece of advice would you, you would give that younger version of yourself? Um, I think the book that started me on this journey was Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week. Um, the, I think, yeah, I think maybe start on the entrepreneurial journey sooner, and also don't be distracted by shiny pennies. Mm. Um, because I think one of my biggest issues is uh, focus and consistency. So um, I've got loads of ideas. Unfortunately, it's a curse as well as a blessing. So stick with one thing, I think. You and me are definitely a kindred spirits on that one. And really great advice. Thank you for sharing that. And also, Sarah, thank you just so much for being here and, and sharing this wisdom and this new perspective that I, um, I'd never heard it presented in this way and seen the value of the storytelling and humor and, and how they're how there has to be a certain balance to them and, and all the things that come into play. So I'm hoping and really confident that this also landed well for a lot of my audience. So thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure and I love the work that you do, Andrew. So, you know, thanks for sharing your stuff with the world and helping change people's lives. Thank you again, Sarah. I really appreciated that awesome, awesome interview. Guys, I will have all relevant links both in the YouTube description of this video, if that's the format that you're watching, or you could always check the links by the audio section in shatteredmoldpodcast.com where this episode resides. I highly recommend you check out her links and see what she's up to because obviously she knows her stuff. Also, quick reminder, uh, if you haven't done so already, feel free to go to lastlawofattractionbook.com. You can check out my book on Amazon there. It's in Kindle or paperback or audiobook if you prefer that format, or you can check out youtube.com slash andrewcap if you want to check out the free content devoted to the book. With that said, thank you as always for sticking around. Thank you for checking the show out, and stay tuned. We've got more awesome guests on the way shortly. I will see you next time. Thank you for listening to Shatter the Mold at www.shatterthemoldpodcast.com. My name is Andrew S. Kaplan. My name is Andrew S. Kaplan, and it's time to shatter the mold. <laughs>